Good afternoon, everyone. We just had a little bit of technical difficulties. We apologize for being a little bit late this morning, but we're gonna jump um, right to it um, in terms of uh, our webinar today. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, returning uh, to youth sports safely amid our, the COVID epidemic. My name is David Rubin. I'm the Director of Policy Lab at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which is a center of emphasis within CHOPS Research Institute. Conversation today is part of an ongoing series that we're doing uh, at Policy Lab and hosting this summer, bringing together experts in all different fields to address some of the impacts of the pandemic. Our prior events have centered around uh, reopening K-12 schools, as well as ensuring support services for children with special health care needs. You can find these conversations on our website, and I encourage everyone to visit us online to find all of our great resources. We, uh, we have some exciting things coming as well, including more of these virtual conversations, and I encourage you all to sign up for our newsletter and follow us on Twitter for the latest info. You know, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve, we know that kids and families are in search of some sense of normalcy, and we know how important organized sports and fundamental activities are as they provide opportunities for socializing, uh, but also to support children's growth and development on and off the field. Last month, uh, experts at CHOP collaborated to create guidance on returning to youth sports amid this pandemic uh, for programs, coaches, and athletes. Uh, but a lot can happen in just a month. I must emphasize, that, unfortunately, that we're now in a much different position than we were when we created our initial recommendations. Uh, if you look at our models today, there's increasing risk for virus resurgence in almost all parts of the country. And the hottest uh, location right now is just to our south in Baltimore, and we're seeing resurgence in the Philadelphia area as well. Given this landscape, many schools are opting now for virtual learning. We just saw Baltimore go to virtual, uh, virtual learning yesterday to begin the school year, and some college sports are choosing not to resume play in the fall. We know so many families are wondering what this means for their children's sports team. So we're here today to address why it's important for, uh, why it's so important to get our athletes back on the field, uh, how we might provide guidance for those who are already playing sports at this time and what needs to happen to keep everyone safe uh, moving forward. So let's jump in. I'm gonna give you some introductions to our speakers. First up, we have uh, John Solomon. John is the editorial uh, director of the Sports and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. The Aspen Institute's Project Play develops and shares knowledge that helps build healthy communities through sports. Next, we have Dr. Susan Coffin. Uh, she's a professor of pediatrics in our Division of Infectious Disease at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and an attending physician at CHOP and probably the best infection control expert I've spoken to in all my travels uh, with regards to COVID. Also with us today is Dr. Matt Grady, a pediatrician with expertise in primary care sports medicine with our, within our sports medicine and performance center at CHOP. Matt's active in the sports med medication uh, ed education and policy areas, and he works with several area high schools on guidelines for athletes following concussion injuries. He brings coaching experience and, uh, and perspective with him as well. Next, we have Dr. Christina Master, a pediatric and adolescent primary care sports medicine specialist in our Sports Medicine and Performance uh, Center at CHOP and co-director of CHOP's Minds Matter Concussion Care for Kids. And lastly, we have Kate Easby, an athletic trainer in the Sports Medicine and Performance Center at CHOP. She's also worked as an athletic trainer within school setting, settings in the greater Philadelphia area. John, uh, as, as our, um, our guest here today joining us at CHOP, I'd like to start with your perspective. As we begin our discussion about safely returning to youth sports, I think it's important to center our discussion around the goals of youth sports in general. What, what do sports provide to kids and what are some of the benefits of team sports and how do you contextualize that when you think about where we are in this epidemic? Yeah, so first, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and discussing such an important topic. Look, we know that sports, when delivered properly, provide many physical, social, and emotional benefits to kids. There's a lot of research documenting that active kids do better in life. Uh, over their lifetime, physically active kids have higher self-esteem, lower levels of depression, uh, they're more likely to go to college, have higher annual earnings, have reduced risk of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, have lower health care costs. There's tremendous value to being physically active. And we recently created some infographics at Project Play um, that you can find at as.pn backslash sports facts that shows all of this. Of course, all of these benefits are predicated on delivering a positive sports experience for the child. I think that's important to note. Yes, physical activity is tremendously valuable, but if the experience isn't enjoyable or helpful for the child, they're likely going to quit at some point. 
So even before the pandemic, we have research showing uh, that the average child quits sports by about age 11 and after about three years of playing. And the biggest reason is that the sport isn't fun anymore. We know that different sports offer different benefits and different children have different needs. So Project Play also has a website, uh, healthysportindex.com, that allows parents to evaluate the 10 most popular boys and girls sports based on three areas of health. We look at physical activity, injury risk, and psychosocial benefits. And what we did was we used data and medical expert analysis to compare the sports against each other in order to help inform families of what are the right sports for their child. So when families consider returning to sports, when it's appropriate, healthysportindex.com can help in that process. Of course, what's happening right now is a lot of kids are losing the benefits of sports. Uh, the University of Wisconsin recently published a study that found 65% of adolescent athletes reported anxiety symptoms in May, with 25% suffering moderate or severe anxiety. And using historical data, the study found that the rate of mild to severe depression in youth athletes has increased from 31% to 68% during the pandemic. Uh, we recently did a survey of youth sports parents at the Project Play, and also in conjunction with Utah State University, and we found that the average child who plays sports has seen their participation per week decline by 48% during the pandemic. Not exactly surprising, but you, you can see what some of the, uh, the declines are occurring. Kids are participating 32% less in free play, 60% uh, less in practices, 67% less in games. This increasing level of inactivity is even worse for low-income youth. Uh, before the pandemic, kids from the wealthiest families spent about 40 minutes per week more in sports than kids from the poorest families. Now during COVID-19, that gap is about two and a half hours. We're at great risk of further dividing the haves versus the have-nots in terms of who has quality access to sports and physical activity. And this has happened in the past couple of decades as youth sports have become more privatized and commercialized. So it's why as we hopefully recover from COVID-19, we believe at Project Play, we need to create a more quality and affordable youth sports opportunities in local communities. That will be a more sustainable model for all kids to access sports. I think it's important to note and to be clear that bringing youth sports back right now is difficult. You know, it has to be done in a safe manner based on local conditions in your community that is supported by public health experts. Uh, we've seen, we believe, too many club and travel sports teams tournaments that have rushed back into large gatherings across states and regions um, simply to make money for adults and to provide local tourism dollars. Many public health experts have cautioned that travel sports should be the last phase to return in youth sports. As we speak, for example, the AAU Junior National Volleyball Tournament is wrapping up a week-long event in Florida where we know COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations are rising. Pretty soon, the AAU Junior Olympics will also be coming to Florida for two weeks, and that's gonna have an estimated local impact of three to $4 million for that community. So it's concerning that some people think it's okay for large youth sports events with travel from around the country, you know, coming to a state like Florida right now. There have been some reports um, from local county officials and uh, from uh, state governors and through uh, athletic administrators connecting youth sport events to some COVID-19 outbreaks in states like Missouri, Kentucky, Iowa, and Indiana. And parents are watching how youth sports return and they're increasingly concerned. Uh, our latest survey showed that six out of 10 parents fear their child will get sick by returning to sports. 53% uh, of youth sports parents say their child will resume sports at the same or higher amount as before the pandemic. And that's down from 70% from our survey in early May. So we all want our kids to play again, um, but it just has to be done responsibly. And I think that's an important point we have to keep making. Um, look forward to being part of this conversation. Again, thank you for having me. Yeah, that was great, John. Thanks for that overview. Dr. Coffin, um, things look a lot different this week than they did even a couple of weeks ago uh, with the increasing uh, transmission rates and case counts returning to the Philadelphia area. 
What do you think needs to be in place regionally to, for teams to scale up their activities? I know there's a lot of confusion right now as to how to do this and how to set standards. You've got scholastic teams, you've got, um, you know, some of these travel leagues, uh, you know, um, you know, and once it's safe, what safety measures would be, would you, what should teams be putting in place to reduce the transmission of this virus? So I think that, um, you know, some of the basic principles that we've been hearing time and time again about how to stop um, passing virus from person to person uh, pertain here. So the principles of uh, minimizing the gathering of people when there's a lot of virus in your community is paramount. We just heard John describe how um, premature um, uh, gatherings uh, around sporting events may have actually accelerated or contributed to expansion of outbreaks locally. And that would, in the end, undermine our, our larger purpose of trying to both uh, achieve and sustain control. So once we begin, we can continue to have our kids participate at whatever level of sports they choose to. Um, I think the other basic principles have to do with spacing. Um, for uh, sports that are outdoors, you have natural advantages that you both have more space as well as you have um, dilution of, of respiratory um, viruses um, if somebody in your group is infected. And then the last piece is to um, uh, consider when um, and how to best use masks. Masks are going to remain important for us to try and incorporate into some of our activities and some of our athletic activities, particularly when there are going to be athletes gathering face-to-face -face in situations when virus is in our community. There are a lot of different um, proposals about how this might be done um, care, uh, uh, thoughtfully um, uh, and with an accent on um, activities that do not involve person-to-person um, uh, -person contact, um, a focus on uh, drilling and conditioning when virus is high. But I think we still need to remember that respiratory protection is going to be necessary when we have gatherings of people. Thank you, Dr. Coffin. Yeah, Dr. Grady, I know you've got some concerns beyond just the simply uh, risk for infection among children, uh, their coaches, and their families. Um, talk to us a little bit about the way you see uh, how how you think about some of the additional concerns as we race back to youth sports. Um, thanks, David. I think that uh, John's point was well taken, that during the pandemic, a lot of kids have not been as active as they have been. Uh, we had our own uh, internal data from CHOP, and we showed that 70% of the athletes uh, were, had decreased their exercise during COVID, and, and as many as 50% of them had decreased by at least 50% their activity. So as the, we start to open up, we have a group of athletes who haven't been training and haven't been participating. If we looked at what happens at the professional level uh, with the onset of uh, reopening, they've all had at least a one-month training camp. And unfortunately, we went from we're not doing any training to low, let's have a tournament. Um, and whether that was an economic driver or just a desire to get out, um, the reality was that we had a lot of kids jumping back into sports very quickly. Uh, and for the past two weeks, I've been seeing elbow and shoulder pain uh, in my uh, adolescent baseball players who went back to playing multiple games in a tournament. Uh, we did look at our data and showed um, what athletes thought they were ready to do. And about 50% said they were only moderately or somewhat prepared to return to play. 12% said they were not return, ready to return to play at all. And about 45% thought moderately ready. So our athletes didn't think they were ready to go back to competition. But as soon as the youth sport bucket kind of opened up, uh, everyone rushed back to play. And so from my standpoint, uh, there is still a process of getting ready for competition. And that there should be some ramping up period, working on your skills, uh, before we get back to actual full competition. Yeah, I think it also helps, uh, uh, Matt, because it gives us time while we're conditioning the athletes to also see what direction we're heading in, um, rather than rush back into a situation as case counts are already increasing. So th there are a lot of reasons why that makes a lot of sense. Um, Dr. Masters, uh, you know, from your perspective, do we have any hope of returning to our contact sports is football done? What what's your sense of these of these higher contact sports? We know that not all sports are created equal. What do you think of the conditions that would need to be in place, pledges, testing, et cetera, in order to ramp up from practice to scrimmages uh, and to maybe some games at a regional level? 
Yeah, Dave, I mean, that's, I think, the million dollar question. And actually, a million dollars may not be a price tag that's so far off in terms of what we need to invest in this. And I think absolutely there's hope for football in the fall. But I think as with everything else, we can't just hope. We have to act. And I think we have to realize that we are responsible for this. When you look at what we can learn from the professional sports that have gone on to try and conduct um, successful sports seasons, um, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn. I think that the ramping up period for training as well as to see what um, the uh, circulating virus is in your community is a big um, important fact. And I can't um, underemphasize what Susan said. The prerequisite for safe competition in sports requires a really low level of circulating virus. The reason that the Bundesliga in Germany was able to accomplish a six-week um, you know, se uh, season and complete it successfully with really no, um, no infections after the initial testing when they brought everybody into their bubble um, was because they had low rates in their community, they did extensive testing, and they were able to basically put out any um, embers or fires because the cases were low and they could do the um, contact tracing adequately and put that out. I think from that standpoint, we can learn from that. Even what's going on right now in um, Orlando with the um, MLS and the NBA bubbles, they are successfully doing it as well. And it just shows you, if you have those resources and you have the levels of transmission, they're artificially creating low levels of transmission in their bubble in Florida, because obviously they're in a context where there's a lot of um, virus circulating. Uh, the youth sports um, arena doesn't have that luxury of being able to create a bubble. You know, we live in communities, we live in contexts where uh, whatever the viral transmission is in the community, that's going to drive what's happening in sports. And so I think from that standpoint, we have to act. It's going to be um, about our making those decisions that are hard decisions. I think our athletes understand that. And we talk about this a lot in the office. Um, and it happens to be, you know, true, whether it's concussion or musculoskeletal injury or COVID. Our athletes understand that there may be short-term sacrifice to get that long-term gain. And we'll put it in very concrete terms. If you want to have football or sports and competition this fall, are you willing to say, well, you know, I'll forego going to um, the shore and potentially catching COVID and potentially having uh, COVID transmitted and contributing to increased increasing rates in my community because I want to have school and I want to have in-person school and sports in the fall. Um, you know, if that's not as important to you, then you know you can make that individual decision and say I'd rather go to the shore instead of have sports this fall. But that is the choice that lies before us. And I think from that standpoint, um, most of our athletes understand what that is. I think it's up to the community to say we've got to make those decisions and choices as well. And make no mistake, um, there are consequences for each of our individual decisions, not just for others, but for us, um, and there is no free pass. So um, I am hopeful, but I do think we have to act, and we have to act decisively. Um, and right now, the way that our guidelines were designed, um, they were not designed as a one-way street, where once you start training, you, there's an automatic pass advancing to um, smaller group training, large group training, um, intra squad scrimmages, and then game competition and tournaments without having to make sure that at each checkpoint we're making sure that the criteria are met so that we're doing this in a safe way. So right now, um, with the cases going up in Philadelphia, in the same way that Governor Wolf has had to roll back some of the reopening in terms of indoor dining and sizes of groups of gatherings, um, et cetera, and, and bars being closed, that in the same way, sports has to respond um, similarly that, you know, tournaments um, and games for some of these sports where you have high um, athlete to athlete contact for prolonged periods of time and potentially indoors, all those factors, we may have to roll those back because we're not in the place where we can do that. We're going to have to roll back to skill development and training. Um, before we can go back and ramp back up to scrimmages and games. And so, again, um, I think our athletes get this. It's really a matter of if the rest of the community can rally around this and understand that what we do will determine whether or not our kids are in school in person this fall and whether or not they can play any sports. Thank you, Dr. Master. Uh, you know, Kate, you've had experience on the ground as an athletic trainer. You've been in these schools. What do these changes look like in reality for young athletes and the staff that manage these teams? Thanks, David. I uh, really appreciate that. So I think there's going to be a lot of changes, and this is going to look very different for our athletes at all levels um, moving forward um, with this virus around. 
I do also want to reiterate what Dr. Master said and Susan said about um, that the virus is still very active. And while it's still very active, we have to have our precautions up. And I also think it's really important to make a policy or a procedure as to how we're going to manage that and what that looks like, which again is going to be very different. Um, I think a lot of it is make, like making sure you remind the children and the athletes that Again, it's still very active and we have to have these precautions all the time. Because after a while they go, oh, we're doing okay, it's not a problem. And then they start you know, taking their masks off more or hitting, getting around each other more, which is what we don't want. So again, I think there's gonna be a lot of social distancing um, from the time that you, you, before you even get to practice to when you leave, right? And having that implementation working and having that policy is really important. Athletic trainers can help with this policy and making that plan in place, but a lot of youth sports and club sports don't have athletic trainers. Um, I think if there's a lot of coaches and youth sports here listening today, I think I would encourage them to seek out a local athletic trainer to help implement this plan. Um, but it starts with at home and the parents and the coaches and the, the athletes being honest with themselves, doing a symptom check, checking to make sure your symptoms are okay, doing a temperature check when you get there or at home with the parents or with the coach when you get to the field, having your mask on when you get to the field, not socializing with your friends and sitting next to them and giving a big high five and a hug, sharing water bottles, sharing mouth guards. I've seen it happen. Don't do it, people. Um, sharing um, clothing. Um, these are all things that you know our athletes like to do that we have to remind them this is not the time to do that. And we have to you know, bring our own things, stay away from each other and protect each other really. Wearing a mask during warm-ups is really important. And when you're on the sidelines or having a group breakdown, um, staying six feet apart from each other, all really important. Sanitization of our equipment, are we using equipment even for these um, when we're at higher risk and we're you know, conditioning and things. Um, hand sanitization, when you get home, take off the clothes that you were wearing on the field, wash them immediately, go take a shower, um, these are all things that we need to think about when trying to use precautions and playing sports and being athletic in this time when um, we have this very active virus around. Um, so those are just a few of the things that I would think about. And I think it's just going to look very different on the field for the time being as far as you know, we can see. Thanks, Kate. You know, so we're going to have a really frank discussion now. I will disclose that I'm a former travel coach myself. I will. Uh, I think the coaches who are listening now will know that our number one recommendation is, yes, it's okay to socially distance the parents from the coaches. Um, we're 100% in agreement, right? Um, and all those travel coaches know what I mean right now, right? Um, <laughs> That said, let's ju jump into a frank conversation, and I'm and we're not, you know, and I want uh, our listeners to um, to to really feel free to ask very frank questions. And I'm going to start with one here. I see it in the in the Q and A. We need some bright lines here, Dr. Coffin. Um, you know how do you know what you know what is safe level of circulating virus? What does that mean? How does that fit in the context of school reopenings? We saw Governor Cuomo talk about the number of 5% testing positivity to reopen schools. And should these club sports have flexibility to do something differently than the schools are doing? So, Go for um, it. Uh, thank you. Easy questions, all. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so I think that one of the basic principles that, that rings true to me is that sports should not precede school opening. And I think that still, for almost all of us, remains a, um, a number one goal. Let's get those schools open. And I would hate to have accidental undermining of viral control by, by sporting team events um, that have uh, launched prior to school opening. So that's one thing that I would draw as a bright line in the sand. Another thing has to do with how much virus there is in uh, your community. And Dave and I and others have had a lot of back and forth. What's that number? And we know that Governor Cuomo has chosen the number five. And I've um, been in communication with co colleagues across the country. And that's a number that we're hearing a little more frequently. Um, but I don't think there's a lot of science. 
but I will say it's in the single digits and it's probably five or lower um, in terms of the percent positivity that um, uh, we would want to see for our community, not for our, our athletes or students, but for our entire community. And then the last thing is about trajectory. What direction is virus moving in our community? Are we seeing that the percent positivity is very gradually creeping up? This is what we've been watching for the past couple of weeks in Philadelphia. Or are we seeing what we long to see, which is steady downward um, uh, trends? And that, of course, is really what I think will give us the most hope with both um, opening sports and then progressing through a kind of tiered approach to more and more engagement and more and more return to true competitive play. Other thoughts from the from the, our panelists before I move on to the next question. I think uh, we'll let Dr. Coffin be the uh, the arbiter of that one. Um, not all sports are created equal, everyone. I'm seeing lots of questions about. You know, actually, ice hockey's coming up a lot. Um, you know, it is Flyers Nation out here in Philadelphia, so it's uh, uh, you know ice hockey, football, but then there's tennis, there's volleyball, there's soccer. There, you know. You know, and we've spent a lot of time preparing for this, talking about how to treat these different sports differently with both re respect to maybe a graded strategy about which sports open up sooner, but also how to mitigate risk with any uh, contact versus non-contact, indoor versus outdoor. So there's a lot to cover here. So if you, everyone feel free to jump in. How do we get, how do we guide selective strategies for individual sports? Well, I think that there's a few principles you touched on that we should start off with. Uh, number one, we know that outdoor transmission rates are lower than indoor transmission rates. So we're gonna immediately split the sports into what's outdoor and what's indoor. And the next one's gonna be how close are you to the players you're competing with? And so if we do it by space, we could easily come up with say that uh, tennis and golf, it automatically, even in relatively high rates of transmission for COVID, are relatively safe because you have the option of both base and uh, being outdoors. If we then look at the other sports, cross country, you're a little bit together, but if you alter your start lines or spread out a little bit more, cross country probably is fine because that's also outdoor. I think we start getting, it gets a little bit trickier as we start getting into some of those outdoor sports where we start becoming close together. And so uh, if I looked at lacrosse and uh, soccer as two sports where there is some contact, but the marking when you're playing uh, as a defender, you're not immediately next to the person most of the time, but obviously if someone has the ball, you come in close contact. And in certain situations like a corner kick in soccer, you're gonna have a lot of people crowded into a small area. There'll be a component of being close together. We've talked about that this idea of 10 minutes comes up a lot with sustained contact. And I'm sure Susan could talk about that more, but the closer we are to each other for a longer period of time, the duration of exposure is part of that risk. So if you're playing soccer and you're outdoors and you're not piling up in the penalty box for a corner kick and you're you're practicing, then your risk is lower. And as you get to competition and you're getting into those closer contact positions, your risk is gonna start to go up. I think we would look at football and probably basketball, that the proximity is very close. Basketball has the problem of being indoors and football um, has the, the issue of persistent contact especially in offensive linemen who are gonna be close to the whole time. If you're in a skilled position, you're not as close to the players, but if you're close uh, on the offensive line, that's gonna be there for a longer duration. And then I think we have these other sports that are kind of in between. I think we've talked about volleyball as being not a contact sport, but it's indoors, so that's a little bit of a negative. And your ice hockey, again, similar to probably soccer and lacrosse, except for your indoors. You've added that as a little bit extra. So if I'm stratifying them, I could put one end of the spectrum as uh, cross country and golf uh, as easy, and we can do those even with high rates of in the community. And then when we start getting to basketball and football, um, those are probably going to be really need lower rates. Yeah, and I think that um, sorry, I think that Matt's whole point of thinking about those factors in terms of indoors and then extent of you know, athlete to athlete contact are really the key issues. And the problem is we don't know how to weight each of those factors. So just speaking to hockey in particular as a hockey mom um, and having a vested interest in that personally as well as professionally, that I think that again, 
what we're talking about is getting to rates in the community of uh, levels of viral transmission that enable us to play those indoor sports um, and to enable us to play them without masks. Um, I see a bunch of questions that are coming up right now. What do we do about testing? I think the bottom line is that we are unable to test in the way that these professional and elite leagues are testing that are successful. NBA, Bundesliga, Formula One. Formula One racing started three weeks ago. They have conducted 15,000 tests in three weeks um, and basically picked up two cases that essentially they were able to isolate, contact, um, trace, and um, squash that little ember. We're not like looking at, you know, embers of a campfire. We are currently not even probably looking at a kitchen, you know, stove fire. We're looking at a dumpster fire right now. And we need more than that. And we don't have the resources for that. So the only way to do that is to get to drive our rates low enough so we can do these things safely. Testing is not really going to be the answer for us. It's going to be behavioral change in our community. And then that will result in the downstream lower rates of positive testing. I think that the whole question of, you know, getting symptom checks beforehand, a lot of this is going to have to be personal responsibility. We got a question here about, you know, one athletic trainer, two athletic trainers for like 650 kids. That's real life. And you're lucky if you've got two athletic trainers for 650 kids. So I think we're going to have to look at that. Um, and so from that standpoint, um, masking and distancing can only do so much, you know, um, uh, the question here about micro droplets, um, it's not just micro droplets, there's a preprint MedRxiv MedArchive um, paper that shows that um, aerosols you know, um, can produce replicative virus. And so we have to really recognize and grapple with that. So we need to drive the levels down to be able to have these sports. Um, there are levels of risk like Dr. Grady indicated where um, those lower level risks Sports can move forward probably with competition, um, even with slightly higher levels of risk right now. Uh, but certainly things like football, basketball, um, it's going to be tough um, right now. I also yeah, want to thank you. I also want to say that um, while everybody likes to um, compete in sports, right? Like that's really the fun part is is competing and playing against each other. We also have to remember that um, there's an aspect of, you know, what John was saying about being physically active and why it's important for those things for our health and our mental aspects and social aspects that even if we're just conditioning and doing drills, um, that this is important too. So even though we say, hey, competition for these really, um, high contact sports is really, really risky. What can we do in the meantime to make sure that we're still um, promoting activity for our young kids and or any any athlete at that um, to continue to make healthy decisions and be part of that aspect of sports as well? Um, and just one other thing that uh, Dr. Master was also talking about, I also did see we have two athletic trainers for 650 kids. I've been there. I've been in that school with two athletic trainers, and I think we had nine other um, students. Um, you have to get everybody involved, including your athletes, including your coaches, um, and to, to rely on your other resources within your school or youth or club community to really get this to work well. And I think um, that should be across the board anywhere. You know, the more that we all participate in making sure everybody is safe, the better outcomes that we'll have. Yeah, Here's I, one that I, I have. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, John. I was gonna say, if I, yeah, I think that's a really important point. And one thing, one way to maybe think about this this coming year for youth sports is you may have to reset what the goals are for participating in your particular sport or your team or your league. Um, you know, in our research that we do, it's important to recognize why kids want to play sports in the first place. And in all of our research, the number one reason we always hear is they want to have fun, they want to play with friends. I mean, they also like learning skills. They like competing some, but I promise you, it is far less than um, than just having fun and being with, with teammates. Winning ranks much lower. Adults often care about the competition a lot more than the kids. So if sports are allowed in your community, you know, and depending on the nature of your sport, just getting kids back to skill development and training with appropriate social distancing would be incredibly valuable for kids. Uh, I did a story a couple weeks ago looking at is there a responsible way to bring youth and high school football back in the fall, talking to a lot of medical experts. And the overwhelming opinion, and I tend to agree with it, is that it's, it's going to be really hard. And I, I'm not sure that it can come back this fall. But it doesn't mean you can't do other things, right? Maybe it's flag football if the conditions are on the ground. 
are, are acceptable and okay to do that. Maybe it's just, you know, conditioning outside um, or just different ways to get kids still active and then also still getting the social connection. You know, all excellent points. You know, and let's say, you know, best case scenario, we know travel has been a huge part of our resurgence this summer. And, you know, there's such a component here, and I see it in the questions too, of travel, you know, travel between schools, travel leagues that often go far distance, intramurals, buses. Um, you know, how do we think about travel, even if we get to competition, what are, what are our recommendations around the games this year and these travel leagues? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go ahead. I mean, I, I think you have to rethink, um, you know, your schedule some. It may be that there's not a, in high schools, a state championship or state playoffs. It might just be regional. It might just be local. Maybe you're playing multiple games against the other high school in your community um, or other teams in your community. Um, you just have to really rethink about what's the, what's the real value and the purpose here. I, I don't think this is going to be the year for, you know, chasing championships, um, and, you know, winning as many games as possible. The goal has to be, you know, how can we get kids on the field in a safe way? And if that means you can't travel, you know, to different places, then that's fine. Let's do some intramural games, you know, within kids within your school. Let's play against the, the local community. Uh, let's not do the travel sports events until it's ready. So I think that's that's all got to be part of the equation. So let me go to another one that's gotten a fair amount of interest here from our own Dr. Wong um, uh, over at Carabots. Um, it seems that gyms and teams are not requiring face masks during exercise. They require those masks when 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 individuals, uh, kids are sitting on the sidelines, entering exit, entering or exiting the gym or field, but not while they're exercising. It's challenging to wear that mask if you're really working hard. Um, you know, what's your thoughts on the use of masks when, while participating, while not participating, when you might be able to take them off? I think that's a really difficult question, right? I don't know about you guys, but um, I'm a rugby player. I've played rugby in the past, and I don't think I could play rugby with a mask on. I, I don't think I would get the amount of oxygen I would need in order to perform well. Now, I was, um, I was in a park the other day, I was gonna do some workout, and there was a group of kids working out, and I was like, well, who are these people? And it would turn out to be a local cross country team, and all of them were wearing masks during warm up. And I was like, interesting. And they seem to be okay going through that warm up wearing those masks. So I would say if, if we have a sport that's um, like, golf but you're not really around people but like let's say something like golf where you're not really um aerobically breathing hard all the time um to wear a mask and if it, you're able to i would i would recommend being able to do that um but i i think it's a really difficult question to say you know go wear a mask while you run really really hard and see see if you can perform um so i don't know if any other panelists have any other ideas about that yeah, I think that's a great point, Kate. Oh, go ahead, Susan. I, I was just going to jump in and point out this really underlines why it's so incredibly important to have good viral control. Um, doing anything without a mask is going to be okay once this virus is gone, and it's going to be risky as long as the virus is in our community. And so right. that is just such a big part of this equation. One practice that I've seen um, uh, done by runners um, in Philly, and um, including some people that look like the pretty elite runners, is they run with a, a neck or a, like a neck gaiter on, and they just slip it up for a second, and then slip it down as they pass people or move into a more crowded area. And I thought that that was a really thoughtful and creative way for them to continue to train at a reasonably high level and be considerate of other people um, uh, as they're doing that. Yeah, I think we you just know, need to really reinforce what Susan's saying about driving those levels down because that's really the only way that we can compete. Um, having football or ice hockey players wearing masks during competition is just not going to happen. And if you look at some of the scientific data, there was a question here about distancing and time. Um, I think six feet and 15 minutes are the numbers that are batted around in terms of what um, is a, a bright line dividing lower risk and higher risk. Um, without masks, um, you know, if you're outdoors, probably 12 feet 
is what you need um, from studies that came out of Europe with um, regard to runners and the slipstream of um, viral particles that can be caught in the um, slipstream of your aerosol droplets. Um, and so outdoors might be 12 feet if you're not masked. But that said, that all really is dependent on what the bottom line uh, rates of transmission are. And if those are low, then we can worry less. Um, but if they're high, uh, nothing that we're going to do is really going to make a difference from that standpoint. Yeah, honestly, I mean, I think that's a good point, Dr. Messer. I've, I've actually thought as I've traversed some of the political conversations, you know, we've gotten into big political debate around masking and other things, that in many ways I would like to see our university coaches uh, stand up because honestly, if if people understood that college football may not be coming back this fall, and some of these influential coaches, I think the South would agree to quarantine for at least a year to ensure that didn't happen. Um, and 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 there, so there are people we're not hearing from enough um, that probably could persuade a change in behavior. And it, it's just a, a you know to me the relative influence that these sports has within your communities and the relative influence of the coaches um, and the leaders of these uh, clubs to try to help people understand what's really at risk now, because if we don't get those transmission rates down, it's it's both school, it's sports, everything collapses. Um, so that's just my contextual statement to, to add on to what people have said here. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of this idea, you know, we talked about quarantines. I remember talking about that with, with you know, these these compacts within sports teams to try to re reduce the likelihood of an infection breaking through. It gets to the issue of surveillance. Um, we're also watching now as testing seems to be hard to come by, and when it's there, it's five, ten days delayed if you go to LabCorp or Quest. Uh, you know, how, how should people be thinking and coaches be thinking about, you know, the types of screenings that need to be in place to get people, particularly for those indoor sports or contact sports, going again? How would you run this? knowing the obstacles in front of you right now, even if we had low circulating infection? So I think the biggest thing is to have a plan in place, um, is to make a policy and a plan and how to, and to implement it um, for you know, the screening process and what what is, you know, what is considered you know, what is essential for the screening process in order to make sure that kids are safe. Again, it all goes back to viral load and making sure that's low. Um, but then having a symptom checklist that students, athletes fill out, having that compact that says, I'm going to do this before every practice, and I'm going to do this after every practice, and I'm going to do this if I don't feel well, and I'm going to let people know because it's for the safety for me and everyone else around me. So making that plan i think is most important and there are a lot of resources online of different um templates and such to use and what symptoms um our policy i believe does also list those symptoms for you, you can make it into an excel spreadsheet um you know check off those symptoms get your temperature down or temperature checked excuse me um hand sanitize wear your masks um and have that plan in place so that when you are in Impl implementing that plan and you're ready to go back to some kind of sport activity, you know what you're doing and you know what the process is if X, Y, and Z happens. Um, I also, there were some questions about the different kind of thermometers and such. Um, of course, it's, it's, it's money to make sure that we have this equipment on hand to be able to do this um, and to make sure that people have reliable um, thermometers. Um, I do think the touchless ones are good. Um, I am the chair of our local rugby team, and I have helped set up our protocol for that. And everybody um, signed a waiver. Everybody does a symptom check when they get into practice. Everyone has to wear a mask when they get to practice. Everyone has to be temp checked when they get into practice. And if someone gets sick or if they feel sick, they have to let us know. Um, and of course, we're having a very um, regulated practice right now. There's no touching or anything, just um, in case people are wondering. Um, but I think that all, having those things are really important in order to move forward with a process. Yeah, and uh, one, one thing I would add also is I think um, a big part of this is changing the culture and changing the behavior and educating people about what return to play has to look like in order for it to occur. So someone had mentioned earlier that um, something about, you know, school, when schools come back, let's emphasize schools first be, before sports. And I agree. And, and initially, 
uh, the big emphasis, a lot of the thought in youth sports was this is in the pandemic, you know, in March and early April. OK, when schools come back, then we know sports can come back. But first, schools first, because schools have some more value, the belief is, but also that they're an educational setting where you can teach kids and adults educational based habits about what, you know, social distancing must look like or mass and what you touch and don't touch. Instead, youth sports ended up coming back before schools. So I think a lot of people in the community still don't have the educational background in terms of understanding, you know, what this new experience is going to have to look like, you know, moving forward. I think that's a good segue, John, to, to a question I see here, which is really interesting, which is in some ways, scholastic sports are easy, easier to regulate. And uh, there, you know, I have a question from someone in Ohio that's been observing sort of very loose, you know, um, loose participation in masking and distancing requirements around some of these travel leagues. And it's sort of like the restaurant industry, right? There's probably a number of club sports and youth sports leagues that are trying to do everything by the letter of the law. But there's also some that uh, potentially, uh, uh, you know, are, you know, are at risk of going a little rogue or not enforcing uh, or having the ability to enforce things among parents. And and so how do you think of the context in terms of some of the independence of these leagues and how best if you were, at, let's say, working at the state, for example, what's the best sweet spot of, of regulating versus flexibility to these leagues? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, because youth sports as a whole is uh, very fragmented around the country. There's no other countries have a sport ministry, you know, and so you have to, you know, follow certain rules and requirements. We have none of that in the U.S. So it's a lot of guidelines, a lot of recommendations, and then fit it within, you know, how it works for you. Um, it's it's a challenge. Um, and look, I'm a, I'm a youth soccer coach for my 11 year old son and a rec soccer. And, you know, we're debating and trying to figure out what we'd be playing in the fall. This is the time of year we'd be, you know, getting ready pretty soon, having fall practice. And um, I was out, you know, kicking the ball the other day with another dad and his two sons and my son, proper social distancing, just kicking back and forth, not touching the ball. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, this is three kids right now. OK, what's going to happen when I have 10 more? I'm not like a teacher. I'm I'm just a volunteer coach who's going to try to do the best that I can. Can I really handle 13 to 15 kids trying to follow these guidelines? And it's it's a lot to ask of volunteer coaches without proper training and just putting them right back into this. This is why athletic Other trainers are so important. <laughs> I would consider seeing if you can get a local one to help you with that with that as well. But you're right. I think the coaches, a lot of it's going to be on the coaches, and that's going to be really difficult, especially for those youth and rec, speak, you know, ones that are, you know, you're just a parent. And you want to have a good time and, you know, enjoy your kids and teach soccer. Um, it's difficult to manage that as well as this um, medical crisis. I mean, I imagine there's some flexibility. I mean, like, you know, I think I saw some earlier recommendations that there'll be no attendance of parents. Um, at any of uh, you know, at any of the you know, any of the practices or the games, and I pointed out, well, this, you have the outdoor indoor thing again too. I mean, I've certainly attended, I'll, you know, softball uh, yeah, tournaments where there's plenty of opportunities to to space out, even without your mask, because you can achieve you know acceptable distancing. So again, being flexible. But that said, what do you do when parents are not playing by the rules? You're a coach. You're trying to coach the kids, like like. How is this going to work when you have uh, differential levels of buy-in in terms of the crowd? Like, what, what have you know? What should the coaches or the league officials do when when you just can't achieve that consistency? Dave, I, I might say that you could probably start before you get to the games um, with some better guidelines for families who are participating. Uh, I think that Dr. Master talked about. Um, having a contract, uh, a COVID contract with families. And so if we're going to be able to play, this is, these are the things we need to do. And as part of this contract, I need my athletes to be willing to follow rules and regulations. I need my parents to be willing to follow rules and regulations. And we know that if the parents and athletes don't follow these rules and regulations, then the risk is we'll get infections, we'll have to um, trace out who's been exposed and want to end up canceling seasons. And so I, I guess I don't want to have it at the at the end point to say, oh, I have someone without a mask on. Um, 
now what do we do? I'd rather like not get to that point by trying to have some discussions before we actually start playing. Um, and then I think, as Kate said, you have to have some pretty great guidelines. And so if the guidelines are all of our spectators have to have a mask on, and if you don't have a mask on, you're going to be asked to leave. And I certainly don't want to create any kind of physical interaction or altercation, but I think you want to have expectations up front and clear what we're going to do and then implement the policy that you've already created. Yeah, I definitely agree with um, what everyone is saying so far. And I do think that when it comes right down to it, um, we have to recognize that this is within our control. We can set those expectations and expect people to meet them. I think if we're gonna try and learn from what the elite professional athletes are doing, what Bundesliga did was they issued a 50 page document that told their athletes what they were supposed to do when they washed their hands. After you wash your hands, what you should you dry your hands with? You should dry your hands with a disposable towel whenever possible. If you sneeze into a handkerchief, you should wash that handkerchief in 60 degrees Celsius. So they dictate a lot of things because those athletes understood that they had experts that they could rely on who were communicating to them the scientific facts to keep them safe, to enable them to play sports. And that's what we have to rely on right now is our experts and what they're telling us. And so a uh, couple questions that I wanted to get out here to our panel. Um, uh, Dr. Fran O'Connor has joined us. He's one of the former presidents of our professional society, the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. He has a couple of great questions that I think I would direct to Dr. Coffin, who's our expert. Um, he's asking about um, where the 5% testing uh, positivity numbers come from. You know, is it um, evidence-based? Is it uh, our best guess at where we are right now? What does that mean? And I know we've had conversations about this. I think it'd be helpful to enlighten our whole group on that. Well, I have to say that this is not a terribly evidence-based um, uh, uh, measure yet. I think that we're learning more and more from modeling and, and when we think about how many people you need to have infected in order to sustain transmission in a community, it's probably going to be more than a very um, few percentage points, but not everybody's presenting for, for testing. So it's hard to make a real population-based estimate of, of the um, uh, disease activity. Um, I hope over time, People like Dave and other other modelers will give us a little more sense about is there actually a prediction? Oh no! Oh, we just lost. Uh, <laughs> uh, she, wants, she wants us to develop a prediction model. Is what I heard. Um, but Dr. Coffin, you back? Yep, I'm back. <laughs> there you go. And so then the other question that Dr. O'Connor was um, posing too that um, I might um, uh, direct to Dr. Grady is um, the exposure that kids have when we're educating them, you know, what's the risk that we're talking about in terms of the risk to the kids? Is the risk really greater to the kids or is it greater to the transmission to their family members or grandparents, a little bit of both? You know, how would you approach educating our athletes about this in terms of their risk, their individual risk, and then their, you know, group risk in whatever context they're finding themselves in? I think Dr. Coffin may be able to speak a little better to individual risk. I think what we've uh, observed so far is the risk of child-to-child -child spread seems to be less than the risk of adult-to-adult uh, -adult spread. Um, but that risk isn't strictly a child-to-child -child as, as a uniform thing. And as we go down the scale, uh, it seems like the younger children seem to transmit a little less. And as we get to the high school level, their transmission rates kind of look like the adult levels. Um, so I think I would be, in my mind, stratifying them if you said um, fourth grade and under, maybe one set of risk, and um, high school and above, probably a different set of risk. I think that when we're talking about risk, we, uh, we can understand risk to ourselves if we have an immunocompromised person in our life, um, but the reality is we don't always know who we're coming in contact with. And so we, we do have a social obligation, in my mind, to try to minimize the risk of infection for everyone. Um, and so I think you try to talk to children um, about the idea that we have to protect each other. And that's what we're, when we're doing these things, uh, there is a goal to protect each other. Um, I do worry more about youth sports and transmission between um, coaches and players, coaches down to players. I worry about transmission from officials to other officials or officials to coaches. And I worry about transmission from parents uh, to coaches or uh, to other parents. And so just 
thinking about the the athletes as as a risk is a part of the puzzle, but it's not the whole puzzle. And I think the actual transmission of other routes may be a little bit higher, but I think the athletes are capable of transmitting, but probably at a lower rate. And Dr. Coffin, if you have any other suggestions uh, on that topic, I'm certainly going to defer to you. No, I, I think you, I think you um, uh, described things appropriately. The one extra wrinkle I'd add in there is that most of our um, knowledge about transmission comes from more social interactions and not through athletic interactions. Yes. And with more forceful breathing, higher rates of breathing, perhaps much um, closer um, physical contact, we may need mm -hmm. to rethink um, what the you know um, transmission risk is. Um, but we will be learning that in the future. Hey, Dr. Master, I just wanted to get a couple of thoughts because, you know, with the benefit of having been in several of these webinars and other conversations, you know, things begin to overlap. So the question about testing positivity and why 5%, well, the lower the better. Uh, there's a site now at Georgia Tech that's actually showing that, you know, for different types of community spread, um, what's the risk that if you're in a certain size gathering that you're going to be exposed to someone with COVID? And the reality is you need a margin of error. Um, so, because there are going to be times when the mask is off or when, the, you know, and, and the margin of error is going to be much greater in, in, with lower circulating rates. And if, and if they're really high circulating rates, the number of exposures or potential kids are going to need to be kept out. You're not going to be able to field the team. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so yeah. these are a couple of, the, so these are a couple of things that I kind of consider. And then separately, uh, in terms of the pledge, I mean, there are pledges I think you'll ask your teams to make. Uh, from the high school arena of schools, as you do the pledge or all the things you do for your team. Um, they, I, I liked a comment I heard from another um, another pediatrician who said, also add the clause, who are you doing this for? I pledge to do this for, sometimes it's for your coach who has an illness, sometimes it's for a grandparent. So, and I think that, get, that uh, you know, instills upon the kids, not just their team, but there's someone usually in their life that gives them a greater sense of their conscience of why they're committing to certain, um, uh, you know, certain, uh, uh, you know, initiatives to not uh, spend time in large groups or to effectively distance or wear their masks when they're in school. And I think you, uh, that can be reinforced in the youth sports environment. So I'm going to transition to another question here, which is the sense that we still don't know a lot about this disease. We know that the kids are less severely affected. Uh, you know, we don't we don't lose a lot of sleep. We do. We have seen though some severe inflammatory syndromes in kids. But there's a question here, which is we don't know what we don't know. And the degree to which we see vascular issues in some kids, um, we're taking particularly our high school athletes, but even our younger athletes without that knowledge of could there be long-term consequences? And are we putting our athletes in jeopardy by exposing them to this risk on the field? Yeah, I think that that's a great question, and we are getting them from our practicing pediatricians in the community even now. So um, Dr. Gray and I just got an email from Dr. Harrington and our care network about cardiac issues. Um, and absolutely, you know, from that standpoint, um, there are statements from the American College of Cardiology, um, from sports cardiologists um, such um, as uh, Dr. Aaron Baggish at Mass General, um, and even our pediatric cardiologist, uh, Dr. Steve Paradon, who runs our exercise lab at CHOP, They've made statements indicating that kids who have had COVID likely need some cardiac screening, possibly pulmonary screening, if not active testing, um, including things like EKG, um, echo, possibly exercise trust testing and pulmonary function testing. And so this is still being worked out like you described, but I think that there are things that we don't know yet. The things that we do know are giving us an indication of which way to go. And I think that those are, um, they're going to be things that we have to keep an eye on as everything evolves, as it is daily with this. Um, the one thing that I'm seeing here on our questions here that I think I do want to try and address is that um, everyone's here listening and, you know, we're all here because we are practicing, um, you know, either in the clinical arena or sports arena where we actually work with kids. And we really want to have some hard and fast recommendations, you know, all of this you know, uh, sort of intellectual theorizing and, um, you know, talking about um, the issues isn't helpful on the ground, which is where a lot of the folks are on this call. They're on the ground and what do we do? And I think I'm willing to go on a little bit of a limb and anybody on the panel can certainly either contradict or, um, you know, um, or agree or embellish. Um, 
but I think that first off, you know, who should be making these statements? Obviously, club sports um, are a traditional loophole that um, is outside of um, interscholastic sports. And so it can't just be um, school districts and the PIAA making these statements. I do think that uh, Governor Wolf and other um, public health and um, departments of health um, have a role here. Public health is health for all. And health for all means that we can have an open economy, we can have in-person school, we can have sports and competition. If we don't have public health, we don't have those things. It's the bottom line. Um, I think that we're getting a question here, well, you know, what about baseball? What about wrestling? Obviously, that's a huge continuum. At this point, my opinion would be that I think baseball is going to be safer and can be conducted in a safe way with competition right now, um, whereas clearly wrestling cannot. And wrestling is going to be a long time in coming, which is, I think, going to be tough. Um, and we've got a direct question here from um, uh, Dave Cohen um, about you know, if I were in Philadelphia right now, would I let my kid participate in games? And so I think when it comes to the sport, it'll depend, right? I do not think I would let my child participate in games if it were soccer, indoor basketball, football, um, or uh, hockey, or lacrosse right now. I think that if it were tennis, golf, um, and track, uh, running, um, those kinds of things, I would probably permit that. I think our numbers are going the wrong way uh, for participation and competition in those other sports. I would ramp those other sports back to individual and small group training that's distanced. And that's, I'm going out well, on a limb on this one. Yeah, can I add, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna endorse what you just said, Dr. Master, in addition, because you know, let's say you take, for example, Governor Cuomo's recommendations, you open schools if you're less than 5%, and you close schools at 9%. The testing positivity rate that I've seen in Philadelphia, uh, Dr. Coffin can correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, has been around six, is, is hovering now closer to six, seven percent over the last uh, few days. It's not enough to close down baseball. It's certainly not enough to start football and some of those contact sports that, that she talked about. I think you have the advantage with good screening to still be uh, uh, doing these sort of uh, softball, baseball, events, but if you climb up to 9%, and let's say that is the bright threshold that, you know, and I don't have any knowledge of this, that the state or the Department of Health comes out with and says we're closing schools, well, then we're closing down all our leagues. Yeah. Um, you know, and and I think that's what I hear you saying, Dr. Master. So I think yeah. there is some flexibility in that five to nine range yeah. of some of these lower contact sports, but, you know, I'd like to see, you know, the, the contact sports even see better positivity rates uh, to make it uh, to make sure it's extremely safe and again you know, you're, you're making the best uh, you're weighing the you know the best you can with the evidence you have um, uh, but uh, I think I hope that answers a lot of questions here give us clear lines I think that's as clear as we can get I think we have to stay tuned to see what those clear lines are going to be from the Department of Health and the state and I, 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 I would assume they're coming soon right I'm gonna have to agree with Dr. Master and David, I I think that um, you know I just read something that was like, well, if you choose if you choose certain sports that seem to be geared towards more an affluent population like golf, um, tennis, you know that's not fair. We, it should be all or nothing. And I I would say um, yes, no, <laughs> in that I think there's potential for all sports to be practicing at some level right now, whether it's just conditioning or drills, and that at the moment right now there is too much positivity in this area to do contact, high contact, breathing on each other, touching each other's sports at the moment. Um, the lower contact sports, again, having that continuum, like Dr. Master said, I think right now is at a place where we could probably, we can safely do those as long as we have all of our precautions in place. Um, but to also do some soccer drills in a, in a way that we're taking precautions. Um, where we may not be doing scrimmaging or competition with other teams or traveling at the moment, um, but to say at this moment right now with this positivity and what's going on in our community now, how can we um, participate in such a way that's safe for everybody? And I, I'm going to have to agree, I think it's too soon for contact and for um, high contact sports at the moment um, with how we're trending and that we need to keep things really, really safe. But I also think Think people should be getting out there and conditioning because there is something to be said about being outside and having those skills and drills in such a way that you know we can make it safe for everybody. Yeah, and if I could just add there, 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 
There, there are some states that are considering that question of the high risk versus medium versus low risk. Um, New Mexico is one of the interesting examples. They were, they've come out and said they're going to push high school football and soccer to the spring. They're not going to play in the fall. They're the first state to shut down high school football. Um, but they're saying we're still going to review the other fall sports. They're delaying the start of those for the fall, but the cross countries, or I, don't, I can't remember what the other sports are there for them in the fall, but they're less risk, so they are considering uh, you know, still playing those in the fall. What about swimming pools, Dr. Coffin? I mean, you know, we haven't talked a lot about our swimmers. Do we, you know, is this a is this an urban legend? Is this an urban myth about swimming pools being a problem, or can we give those folks a little bit of flexibility? You know, I don't know enough. I guess water dilutes things. So that's a good, that's a, a check. Chlorine kills kills viruses, including this one. So there's another check. Um, but I've yet to swim nor see um, a bunch of kids swimming with a lot, without a lot of um, splashing and spraying of, of respiratory secretions as kids come up for air. Um, and that, um, unfortunately puts a bit of a stain on on that activity and again the world becomes an easier place to do anything with less virus i i think we're all sounding a bit like broken records but i think that's our key to to um take the next steps we want to in terms of engaging in activities we love yeah i think to follow up on the swimming um you know susan i would probably make a little bit of a distinction between recreational swimming in public pools or club pools versus swim training i think that there is a way that swim training could occur um, with um, a proper implementation in terms of distancing and numbers of swimmers in lanes where they're not going to be um, essentially spreading respiratory droplets so i would you know yeah. try and distinguish that for right. our swimming athletes for sure yeah. and i do think that um, myself as a non-athlete so no 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 no, no. <laughs> there's all kinds of swimming that goes on right um and so i think the other thing that's come up that I think is worth addressing too is this whole question of face shields, face shields for sports that wear helmets. And so again, um, from that standpoint, I think face shields um, you know, are, are something that may be helpful, but they do not replace masks. So again, all face shields do really, if you're playing lacrosse or football or hockey, is um, block very large respiratory droplets. The fact that we know that micro droplets and aerosols can transmit. Um, the, a study came out um, that indicated um, from Europe that people who wore only the face masks were the ones that actually contracted um, uh, COVID um, in an indoor restaurant seating situation um, because the face shield or the face is not um, enough compared to a mask. So I think that that's really important. And then I wanna get to questions that we have about dance and cheer um, uh, from that standpoint, that again, those are still, can you do cheer and can you do dance? Again, it's going to be space and time indoors versus outdoors, you know, and so um, if you're within six feet and you're more than 15 minutes, then you need to have a mask. If you're further apart, then you can do, you know, cheer. And so cheer training probably can happen. Dance training can probably happen in a distance situation, but close indoors proximity um, and no masking, you know, those are all all problems. I think you know, what's the good news here? The good news is that we can actually do something about this. If we can get the virus under control in our communities, then these things can happen. And that is under our control. Can I, here's a really important question from uh, James Patrick Lynch, uh, who I did get your email, Jim, um, and, uh, and we will be in touch. But it's one I've thought about when they took those basketball hoops down in Philadelphia. You know, Big Five basketball, Philly's a big basketball city. You know, there are sports that affluent kids have access to, and there are sports that are um, that uh, many kids in our city who don't have the same means have been an important part of their own growing up, and basketball is so huge. And there are real equity concerns here in how these sports decisions are going to play out. And, you know, it get, you know, and and I don't know if there's a right answer here, but, it, it, you know, it does trouble me that, you know, to see basketball, you know, it is a contact sport. But how how do we how do we kind of think about our recommendations, understanding these equity concerns and providing an outlet for kids, particularly in the city, who don't have the means to play ice hockey or lacrosse um, or some of these more expensive sports? Well, if I can be a little cheeky, my answer would have been to put up more outdoor basketball courts. And so you could decrease the concentration of players at the individual uh, court, 
but you still get them out playing. And I think that uh, outdoor risk is a lot lower than indoor risk. And so if you can get small groups potentially training, um, especially in an outdoor setting, I think you try to do it. I think it'll comments that physical activity is really important for kids uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, we know the mental piece, we know the emotional piece, we know the cognitive piece, all are impacted by physical activity. So I think it's it's up to us uh, to try to figure out solutions. And I think the worst thing I want to come out of this is to say, you know, there's a lot of risks, there's a lot of unknown, and I think we should stop playing sports because we're, we're going to uh, potentially harm someone. And I'm gonna make the case that if we stop doing sports and stop physical activity, we also are gonna harm someone. And so we're balancing a couple of harms here. And so um, I think, Dave, your point is that there are groups that rely on sports for some of their social outlets. And if we take that away, that's a harm as well. So we're trying to balance a lot of things. And I think we need to be a little more creative in trying to find ways to keep physical activity as part of the equation, even if it doesn't mean competition. And clearly competition outside your region is different than competition inside your region. So if I can get intramural sports or local sports in a small community where the risk is relatively low, I want to do that. Yeah, and I want to get back to what um, John also mentioned that, you know, kids play sports because they're fun. You know, they're not dumb like adults and they'll just get on a treadmill and run for, you know, hour and, and that's, you know, that counts as exercise. I think they want to do things that are fun. So if we can figure out ways to make training, intra squad scrimmages um, and um, conditioning, fun for kids, getting them together, getting them together as a team, working out as a team, working towards a common goal, and then also working as a, a community towards that common goal, of driving those um, numbers down so that they can advance in, in terms of their playing sports. Um, we've got to engage them, and we, we're definitely not talking about clamping down physical activity or the things that are doable in the context in which we find ourselves in. I think we just have to make sure that we're doing them wisely and implementing them in a stepwise and criterion threshold criterion based manner. Um, we can't just go willy nilly. Um, you know, these have to be anchored in real world facts. I think if we look at what college football did in trying to bring back all their um, players in June and how there was a start, stop, start, stop. You know, if, um, you know, LSU, last year's national champion, can't get it up and running, you know, who are we to think that we're going to do any better than that? So we've got to learn from them and make sure that we're talking to all of our teams, all of our athletes, getting them all in on this activity, because if we're all in, that's how we're going to accomplish this. You know, to piggyback on what Dr. Master is saying, um, I also think you need to get creative about competition. If you can have skills and drills practice, how can we make that a competition within ourselves or within the kids that are on the field? Um, you know, putting up a net that's knocked over versus the right way so you have a small space to kick a soccer ball to get it through that small hole. Like, how many people can do that in 30 seconds? You know, how can we engage our athletes in a creative way to still have competition, which may not be with a team or with a team across, you know, the state or your crosstown rival or even you know, interscholactically, it's going to be within that practice or in that skills and drills. And how can you make that interesting? It's really important to keep that creativity going to keep these kids and athletes involved. Um, kind of like summer camp. I worked at a summer camp, sports summer camp for a long time. Even the older kids were really excited about competition within each other of something silly. They loved it. And so I think, I you know, there's been a lot of questions about what, what if we can't have any competition? Well, competition doesn't mean playing another team. It can be competition within yourself, um, within those skills and drills. So let's keep our creativity up and keep those kids moving. Here's a really important comment. Oh, go ahead, John, finish it. But I want to make sure I get a comment before we end. Yep. Yeah, with, with technology these days, you can compete against other teams, though, you know, even with some of these drills. And we saw that a lot during the shutdown, on a lot of virtual training, there would be clubs competing against each other. Hey, how many juggling you know, times can you juggle the ball, you know, in soccer or whatever the particular drill is? You could theoretically do that, you know, just you're videotaping your team and, you know, maybe you're creative and competing against uh, the crosstown team. Yeah, I want to, you know, there's a counterintuitive argument that's made here uh, by one of our colleagues at JOP um, that points, he, he points out that, you know, what if we do cancel sports, our scholastic leagues, our travel leagues, then kids are going to, it's going to, there's going to be a shadow organization, pickup games that are even less regulated, right? Um, and we've seen this now, actually, uh, anecdotally, in, with schools cl closures there. We have 
uh, places being set up for kids to, to get child care that are completely unregulated. And, you know, people get creative when, when barriers are placed in front of them. And the question is, you know, maybe we should, you know, should we be trying harder to keep these leagues going even during high positivity rates as a way to at least have some um, measured and structured way to assure safety? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, that question I saw came from our illustrious Dr. Gerber, um, who is in our infectious disease division here at CHOP and, um, and also a sports parent. I think it's a great point. I think it actually mirrors some strategies that other colleges have taken. So just for instance, I know that Cornell University, they surveyed all their students and they asked how many of you would be coming back to campus even if we were all completely online. And the majority of them were. And so because of that, they decided to try and be able to do some kind of hybrid because then they would have some say over the behavior and the commitment of those kids to that community when they come back. I think that's a little bit different from what some of the other schools are saying, um, you know, where I've seen out in California, I think USC is discouraging kids from coming back because they're gonna be completely online. Uh, but then again, I think from that standpoint, you know, um, you may have less say because um, again, you're all online and they're not in person. And so um, can you mandate or expect, um, you know, a level of commitment to the behavior that they would like if they were all on campus? So I think that the whole issue with those sports, um, you know, organizations and having them so that you can have some means of trying to monitor and make sure that the behavior is um, such that it would drive things in the right direction. So I think it's a great point. Um, I know a lot of the schools that we've talked to in the region um, you know, uh, including um, Chipley is one of the schools that we work with. Uh, I really do think that they deserve a shout out in that they are looking at um, really having, you know, engaged, active training for their athletes and having a real positive attitude about how this season, these seasons can be real seasons of development for them um, and not a lost season. Um, and I think that that is a way to approach it um, because, again, that's the context we want to get sports back into and engage. Dr. Coppin, just small questions as we kind of wrap up here. Uh, face shields and hockey and football, how safe, you know, are they, how safe are they? You know, you know, do they mitigate the risk to you? Um, so I think uh, face shields can play a role in terms of adding a layer of um, protection um, in that they will block um, uh, respiratory particles from leaving, you know, an athlete's, you know, mouth or nose. Um, they're not perfect, um, but I think they fall into the better than nothing category. And I would definitely love to see um, in the appropriate sports, um, athletes try to, to accustom themselves to using them. One thing I'd add on that real quick is that um, I do worry about the costs, um, particularly for lower income kids. Are they gonna, is this just gonna become a, 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 another piece of equipment where it's going more to the higher income people who can afford it, particularly like in a sport like football? Um, you know, as opposed to low income. So we want to make sure that if it's used, that the companies are, you know, pricing it in an appropriate way or, you know, or even perhaps even providing it for free or some sort of deals so, uh, so other people can use it. They're wonderful, very inexpensive models of, of doing mass production of, of reasonably high quality face shields. Lots of uh, consortium of academic 3D printing groups are churning them out by the thousands. Um, and I'm sure they would love to support youth sports. So. You know, this is, I'm going to make this the last question, which is we need some bright lines right now, right, uh, to guide people. Lots of questions of where do I go to find out? Who takes the lead in this? Is this the Department of Health? Is this the schools? Is this governor's office? Like, where do you think that this would best be situated from to provide some structure uh, if, if you were all calling the shots? Well, if we were all calling the shots, I think we would love to have Angela Merkel as our leader in the federal level. Um, we're very lucky to have Anthony Fauci um, leading us um, in the national level, and so I think we need to look at that. That said, the way it's played out, it has gone to the states, and I think at this point, because of the many loopholes and the the, the searching for direction uh, in earnest by all of the youth sports organizations and school districts, I do think that it is very reasonable to have the state make this recommendation. I loved what um, 
uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and even Pennsylvania did in terms of um, acting together as a region, um, and what the Northwest did early on in terms of acting as a region. I do think that that has, um, you know, real strength. And, and to be honest, I think the governors in general could um, get together, not just regionally, but even nationally to work on this. Um, and that's what I would call on them to do. I think that that is um, appropriate. Again, Public health is health for all. If we have public health and health for all, then we can have these things. I think we just need to look at Germany and New Zealand and see what's happened and how they're able to open back up again. That's the bottom line, and we can accomplish it. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, short of, short of national standards, it would be nice if we all could agree on what data is really important, you know, reopen and to close, but we're, we're just unfortunately not there yet. I don't know if we'll be there. But short of that, I think the state's uh, should be making the decision, but in particular, public health experts, public health departments, you know, in those states, in those municipalities, because there are, we have seen some states that have reopened, you know, too soon. And in particular, even for youth sports, we're seeing in like in the state of Florida, where so many travel sports and AAU events, you know, have flocked there, even as, you know, COVID-19 cases are rising. I think Any it's really difficult. Yes, I just think it's really difficult because there's a lot of places um, that you can get these things, especially from the individual sport. So, like, um, you know, USA Rugby, for instance, just because I know them, has a recommendation. And part of that is what is it happening locally and statewide, too? So it's, you know, you can get information from your overall heading um, sport as well as from the state and, you know, public health, which I think is probably, you know, that tier, that top tier and then also at the um, county level as well, and kind of look at all those things together. Um, but of course, the public health, I think, is the way to go. Any other parting comments from the from the from the team? Well, I just want to thank everyone today. I know this is a, a really uh, disconcerting time. I know that you know we're going to be watching closely the increased transmission we've seen in the last few uh, in the last couple of weeks, particularly as it moves up the, the Mid Atlantic Seaboard. Um, applaud the governor for trying to get out ahead of it with some mitigation strategies last week. I think our state understands what's on the line here if we can't start to reverse these trends. It's all our school reopenings, it's our youth sports, and these are the foundations of our community and getting parents back to work. Um, there's a real commitment now, to, you know, a need for commitment right now for everyone to get on the same page around how we're going to accept these inconveniences in our life around some of the distancing we're gonna be required to do and the need to use a mask uh, in, in in crowded indoor locations, um, et cetera, so that we can get back to where we wanna be. And so I look forward to seeing everyone out on the field um, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, be back in touch in better times. Uh, thanks everyone.